Hi, I'm Prof L. Welcome to Chemistry Matters. And today we are going to talk about thermodynamics, the very fundamentals of this particular part of chemistry. Uh, very, very important part of chemistry. And um, what I often find is that a lot of students tend to ask why. Why do we study thermodynamics? What's the point of studying the movement of heat in uh, chemical reactions? Well, hopefully, uh, by the end of this video, you might have a uh, better appreciation of the importance of thermodynamics. And certainly in subsequent videos as well, we're going to be talking a lot more about thermodynamics. So, the big question, why? What's, what's so interesting about thermodynamics? <clears throat> and the answer to that is um, we really want to know about whether particular chemical processes or chemical reactions are going to occur spontaneously or not, okay? Um, you know, let's say you've just spent a few squillion dollars on uh, starting up a big chemical uh, factory to carry out one particular reaction and then you finally get to do this chemical reaction, you find that it doesn't actually go or it goes an extremely poor yield. Now, had you known your thermodynamics uh, before you built your factory, then uh, you would have been able to figure out that no, this particular reaction is not going to go, okay? So one of the reasons that thermodynamics is studied is precisely because of that, the fact that we can figure out the spontaneity, <coughs> excuse me, of both chemical reactions and also physical processes as well, okay? So um, where to begin? Okay, so first of all, thermodynamics, what is it? So it comes from the Greek uh, Greek thermo, obviously, meaning uh, heat, and dynamics, meaning power or force. And essentially what thermodynamics is, in, in its simplest sort of terms, is all to do with heat. The fact that uh, in chemical reactions or in uh, processes, heat generally is either given out or is taken in. And that's something that we can relatively easily measure. Okay, so heat is something that you are all familiar with, I'm sure. And you can easily measure heat because you have thermometers. And, you know, that's, that's nice and straightforward stuff. You can easily measure heat using a thermometer. But when it comes to defining exactly what heat is, um, that's a little bit more difficult. And it's very important to realize that heat and temperature are two different things, okay? They're not the same thing. Now heat, how do we go about defining that? Well, the, the classical definition of heat is that if you have uh, two objects at different temperature and you bring them together, then heat is gonna flow from the hotter object to the colder object until both of them are at the same temperature, okay? So heat essentially is a form of energy. And as we find, it always flows from a hot or a hotter object to a cold or a colder object. And that's the direction of heat flow. And we're going to talk about, uh, not in this video, but in subsequent ones, about the reason why that's the case. Why does heat only go from a hot body to a cold body and not the reverse, okay? So what we are really, really interested in in thermodynamics, as I say, it's all to do with heat. But also, there's another form of energy transfer that uh, is of interest, and that is work, okay? So um, what we're gonna say is that, in chemical systems anyway, you can only transfer energy in two ways. You can transfer energy as heat, or you can transfer energy as work, and that's it, okay? So we are restricting ourselves to a very, very simplified system, I guess, as we often do in sort of introductory uh, chemistry. So, heat and work, those are the two important things that we're going to be discussing. So, we're obviously most interested in heat, but um, work is also important as well. And in fact, there's a very important uh, chemical equation, or indeed a thermodynamic law, that uh, involves both heat and work, and that is this here. So, we can say that delta U is equal to Q plus W, okay? Delta U is a thing called internal energy, 
okay? Or in this case, a change in internal energy. Remember, delta always means a change in it, always means final minus initial, okay? Q is your heat and W is your work, okay? So delta U is Q plus W and that is the first law of thermodynamics. And essentially what it says is that heat, or sorry, that energy can't be created or destroyed, okay? It can be transferred, but it can never be created and it can never be destroyed. So essentially, there's a constant amount of heat in the universe, and we're gonna come back to that particular concept, okay? So, um, now, there are a few terminologies in thermodynamics, and I think this is what puts a, a few students off. There's a lot of, of, of terms that you need to learn and to be able to appreciate before you can really get into the good stuff of thermodynamics. And one of them is the concept of a thing called a state function, okay? So a state function, as I say here, is a function whose value doesn't depend uh, on how a process actually occurs. So let's say you're going from A to B in a chemical process. Um, the value of a state function only depends on the value of A and the value of B. It doesn't depend how you get from A to B. So an example of a state function is internal energy, okay? So internal energy is a state function, and we can see that here in this particular diagram. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a battery here, a fully charged battery, and we're going to, dis we're going to discharge this battery in two ways. The first way is we are going to put a spanner between the terminals. Not a great idea if you've ever done that. You'll see lots of sparks, and et cetera, et cetera, smoke. And the net result of that is that you're going to discharge the battery. And in doing so, you are going to generate an awful lot of heat, but you're not doing any work, okay? Um, the second way is to discharge the battery in the more normal manner by, let's say, attaching a motor to the terminals of the battery. The motor can then do work, and at the end of that you end up with a discharged battery, the fully discharged battery. So basically, we're starting with the same start and the same end uh, point, the fully charged, the fully discharged battery, but we're getting there in two different ways. The first way, by losing heat, essentially, and the second way, by doing work and also losing heat, because it's impossible not to lose some heat when you're doing this, okay? Um, so, the overall change is the same. The overall change is delta U, is the change in internal energy for this process, um, but heat and work are not state functions. Internal energy is a state function, heat and work are not okay, because they vary for that same particular process. Okay, so that's a very, very sort of quick idea as to what uh, heat and work are, and we're going to sort of dispense with the work side of things now, we're gonna concentrate on heat, and how to go about measuring heat. How do we do that? Um, well, in order to do that, we need uh, a couple of equations, and a couple of important equations, very, very important equations in uh, thermodynamics. Here's one of them. Q is equal to C multiplied by delta T. Okay, so heat is equal to C times the change in temperature. C, what is the C thing? C is a thing called heat capacity. And this, I guess, um, does what it says on the tin. It's the capacity of something for heat. Okay, so in other words, it's a measure of the rise in temperature that you get when you put a certain amount of heat into a particular object. So let's say we've got a kilogram of water and a kilogram of iron, okay? So we've got the same mass of these things. We're going to put the same amount of heat into them. So we're gonna put them on identical Bunsen burners. We're gonna heat them up for one minute and then we're gonna shut off the heat. We've delivered the exact same amount of heat to both of them at the end of one minute, which one is hotter or are they both at the same temperature, okay? And hopefully you realize that it's gonna be the iron that's gonna be hotter, it's gonna be hotter than the water because water has got a greater heat capacity. It's got a higher heat capacity. You can put in lots more heat into it and it won't raise its temperature 
by very much at all, okay? Whereas um, solids like steel, metals, things like that, they've got very, very low heat capacities, okay? So that is a very, very general equation, a more specific equation and a much more useful one is Q is equal to Cm delta T. Now, <laughs> hopefully you can see the distance between these, or the difference, <laughs> the distance, the difference between these. Uh, this is a big C, this is a small C, okay? And um, this now is a thing called the specific. C, little c, is the specific heat capacity. And this has got units of joules per gram per Kelvin, okay? Now, this is absolutely vital when it comes to uh, measuring heat. This is the equation, more often than not, that you're going to be using in terms of measuring heat, okay? So what we need to know, we need the specific heat capacity, that'll always be given to you. You need the mass of your sample and you need the change in temperature and then you can get the heat, okay? So let's do a calculation here and um, using that particular equation and let's just work through it. So what we're going to do, we're going to take a gold nugget and this particular gold nugget, what we're going to do is we're going to heat it up to 200.0 degrees Celsius and then we are going to drop it <laughs> into a beaker of water like so and We've got 100 grams of water, and that water starts off at 25.00 degrees Celsius, okay? Now, when we drop the nugget in, and we measure the temperature of the water, so now we've got the nugget in there, here's our thermometer, very badly drawn, <clears throat> and what we find is that the temperature, the final temperature of the water there is 28 Point seven four degrees Celsius. Okay, so the question or the questions, so how much heat is absorbed by the water? <clears throat> absorbed, question mark, and two, uh, how much heat is lost by the gold? And third, um, what was the mass of the gold? There's your three questions. How are we going to answer that? Well, we're going to use this particular equation, Q equals Cm delta T. So let's go ahead and do that. So we'll leave those questions there. We'll work over here. <clears throat> so first one or the first thing that we need, uh, we need this piece of information here. We need the specific heat capacity of gold, and that is equal to 0 0.129 joule per gram per Kelvin. And we also know, or we need to know specific heat capacity of water, and that is equal to 4.18 joule per gram per Kelvin. Okay, so how much heat was absorbed? So we're taking this hot piece of gold, we're plunging it into the water and we're finding a temperature rise in the water, okay? So in other words, the water has absorbed the heat. So let's call this heat absorbed Q water and that's going to be equal to C times M times delta T and that's going to be equal to 4.18 joule per gram per Kelvin multiplied by 100 grams okay, of water multiplied by uh, the temperature change, which is 28.74 minus 25.00 Kelvin, okay? C, the mass and the temperature change. Remember, delta is always the final minus the initial. Okay, so then a uh, quick calculation there, and that gives you 1563.32 joules. There's your answer to part one. That's how much heat was absorbed by the water. And therefore, the answer to part two, how much heat was lost by the gold, must be the same amount. Where did the heat come from that heated up the water? Came from the gold. So therefore, the gold lost Q 
Q gold, let's call it, is equal to negative Q water, and that's going to be equal to negative 1563.32 joules. Okay? So there's the answer to part two. Part three, how are we going to go about doing that? Well, let's get some more space here. And we're going to use that equation again. Um, Q equals CM delta T, except we're after a mass now. That's the answer that we're after. The mass of the gold is going to be the heat of the gold over uh, the heat capacity, or the specific heat of the gold, multiplied by delta T. We plug those numbers in, okay? So here is um, Q gold, which is minus 1563.32 joules over heat capacity of the gold, which was 0 0.129 joules per gram per Kelvin, multiplied by, and this is possibly a tricky bit, remember it's final minus initial, the final temperature was 28.74, and the initial temperature was 200 degrees Celsius. Okay, and you work that out, you're going to have a negative on the bottom line, you've got a negative on the top line, and the answer that comes out when you do that calculation, 70.8 grams. Okay, so a little bit to do there. Um, and, you know, that's um, a nice example, I guess, of the transfer of heat. You've got this hot piece of gold, you're putting it into water, the gold is cooling down, the water is heating up, they both end up at the same temperature, and Knowing all of that and knowing the specific heats involved, you can then figure out uh, whatever it is that you want to figure out about that particular uh, system. Okay, so I think we'll call it a day for that. Um, this, as I say, is the first part, the very fundamentals of thermodynamics, and we will take this even further in the next video. So until then, uh, stay safe, and we will see you in the next video. Bye.